Hello, everybody. Uh, good day to all of you. Welcome to this session, Seizing the Landscape Opportunity to Catalyze Transformative Biodiversity Governance. We have an exciting lineup of speakers for you to address various aspects of this big question that we'll introduce to you further in a second. My name is Marshall Kok. I'm Program Leader, International Biodiversity Policy at PBL, Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency. And I will facilitate the session together with Sunita Subramanian from the UN University and the Tatiana Initiative. Uh, next to the speakers, we have made space for your inputs to this session, either through the use of Slido, uh, Slido questions, and um, through questions you can put in the chat box uh, during the presentations. Sunita will moderate the interactive parts of each uh, after each presentation, uh, and hopefully you have already logged in into the Slido system with the links I just showed you. Uh, Sunita will also pick up the questions from the chat box to put to the presenters. And at the end of the session, we will have a discussion and question and answer on the more overarching questions. On the slide, you see the goals of this session. And uh, what we want to do is to really make the connection uh, between landscape initiatives and the uh, emerging global uh, biodiversity framework. And at various sessions at the GLF so far, you will have heard that the CBD is preparing a new global biodiversity framework for the decade to come. It follows on the current strategic plan with its 2080 targets, and that ended this year in 2020. Most of the targets are not met, and if we are to bend the trend of biodiversity loss and start to restore nature, we, as IPBES has told us quite strongly, we have uh, to achieve transformative change, implement transformative solutions that are able to work for nature and people. And we probably all agree that the landscape approach is able to bring about such transformative changes. But what we also see is that so far, in the context of biodiversity governance in the CBD and the emerging discussions on uh, the uh, global framework, the landscape perspective is insufficiently recognized in the ne negotiations and the text. So what we want to do with this session is, one, to explore further how the new global biodiversity can best use and capitalize on the many landscapes initiatives that are occurring worldwide and further contribute to its implementation. And second, we want to discuss if landscape initiatives and their networks like the Global Landscapes Forum, the Satoyama Initiative, could contribute to making commitments, pledges to the action agenda that the CBD has put in place. And with this action agenda, the CBD aims to collect non-state commitments for biodiversity. And we see the emergence of uh, commitments being made by city networks, by business, by the finance sector. But up to now, uh, landscape initiatives and their networks are largely absent of making such pledges. We want to explore further if that would be possible. The program of the meeting is as follows. Uh, first, my colleague Johan Meijer will kick us off with further discussing the potential of landscape approaches in support of the post-2020 framework. And then we hope, but we are a bit challenged here, that John Ajuko uh, will share his experience from uh, the African Landscape Dialogue and his work on uh, regional landscape uh, initiatives in the Horn of Africa. But as he is actually in the field in the north of Kenya, in Turkana, we are a bit technically challenged uh, to get him on board, so we have to see that. Uh, and in case we will not have him uh, online, uh, Johan will uh, highlight, give the highlights of his uh, presentation. Then uh, Michael Nishi will present how integrated landscape approaches can benefit and contribute to the implementation mechanisms of the CBD, the so-called National Biodiversity Strategies and Action Plans. And she will be followed by Nina Bola, who will present a platform that they are constructing at the World Conservation Monitoring Center uh, for uh, collecting area-based commitments of non-state actors. Uh, Non-state actors always raises the question about what is it actually delivering, and that's why we're quite happy that Sophie Percy will present the Landscale Initiative and uh, show how monitoring and reporting and verification of landscape initiatives can take place to increase the legitimacy and trust in such commitments. Uh, I will leave it at that uh, with my intro uh, introduction. Um, I will be strict on uh, timekeeping uh, with the speakers uh, and indicate when they have reached their three minutes. Uh, they only have three minutes left. Um, and I'd like to hand over and introduce uh, Sunita, who, as I said, uh, works with the UN University and the Satoyama Initiatives. Uh, and um, she will uh, get us through the first set of um, 
Slido uh, questions to warm us up and get to know each other a bit better in the uh, context of uh, an, uh, a virtual meeting like this. So, uh, Sunita, <laughs> over to you, please. Thank you. Thank you, Marshall. And good day, everyone. Um, I'm sorry, there's some trouble with, uh, with my video. Um, but it's, it's great that, that uh, we have you all over here um, uh, and, and we can share and uh, interact with you regarding this topic, which we think is really quite an important one uh, towards global policy setting uh, on biodiversity conservation and human well-being. So um, uh, to get us all started um, and to break some ice uh, and, to, and to settle ourselves into our session, uh, we have a set of um, preliminary questions for you, which are poll questions, uh, and if you can start filling them out, it'll be great. So please indicate where you're joining us from. That's the first one to you, an easy one. Where you're physically located. Okay, we have a lot of people from Europe and Asia. Nice, from South America too. And from Africa, that's great. Great. Can we go to the next question then, uh, MJ? We're still having responses, okay. All right, so um, is this your first session or have you already attended other biodiversity related sessions of the GLF yesterday or today. Ooh. Great, great. So you can see the, um, the results live and, and it's nice that, that people are attending multiple sessions and it's it's really nice that, that we're seeing a, a big uh, push for, um, for landscape approaches uh, getting more, much, much more visible. All right, let's perhaps go to the next slide. So how would you define your current role as? Are you involved in research academia, as in an NGO sector, in business? Um, and in the NGO sector, would you consider yourself in conservation or in the social development um, arena? Or would you classify yourself as a government um, um, stakeholder, actor? Most of us are from the research and academia. Eh? Right, we've got quite a number of civil society conservation organizations. Great, nice. And some private business sector too, this is really nice. Uh, MJ to the next please. All right. How would you consider yourself? Would you consider that you're a landscape person with an interest in biodiversity or biodiversity person with an interest in landscape approaches or both of the above or none, neither of them, just that you're curious about what's being spoken of here? Both. Clearly, this is a this is a converted group here. <laughs> this is very nice. Okay. Super. Yeah. Yeah, MG to the next. So how, 
do you, are you aware of the Convention on Biological Diversity's post 2020 process uh, to develop a new global biodiversity framework? Um, score yourself on how aware you are to uh, if you're actually involved um, in, in the negotiations. Okay. There are quite a few of us who are who are getting acquainted or um, yeah who are new to this topic. Many who are in between. Quite a few who are involved in the negotiations. That's very nice. Uh huh. Okay. Great. So, so we do hope that this session will be useful for, for all of us to actually uh, share our understanding um, and, and help us all to, 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 to somehow get an orientation to be on the same page of um, awareness about these issues. Yeah. MJ? Ah, no, no, go, okay, you can go, you can go back. Okay, with this, um, we are done with the first set of uh, Slido polls. Um, there seems to be, uh, yeah, so, so we, we really hope that you will enjoy uh, the presentations that are to follow because it will speak directly to to, um, to the post-2020 process, to how landscape approaches could contribute to the global biodiversity framework. So what's happening at the practice level, what it can, how it can inform policy setting and how policy setting needs to be uh, cognizant of priorities on the ground. So um, um, there's, there's quite a, a bit, I mean, there's, a, there's an incredibly distilled set of information awaiting you from the different presenters. And I'll hand it over to Marcel to introduce the first speaker. Yeah, thank you, Sunita. Um, MJ, if you could put back the presentation. Um, and I'd like to introduce the first speaker, uh, it's Johan Meijer from the PBL Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency. Um, Johan is a researcher working on landscape approaches. Uh, he will be presenting a forthcoming policy brief that aims to further uh, identify opportunities of integrating uh, landscape approaches in the new global biodiversity framework. Johan, over to you. Okay, just uh, checking if the screen is visible, presentation. Marcel? I don't see the presentation here. So, no. MJ, so I need to, I need to share it again. Okay, I will do that. Okay. Well, thank you, Marcel. Uh, indeed, during this short presentation, I would like to uh, brief you. on our forthcoming policy brief on landscape approaches and arrangements in support of the uh, CBD post 2020 global biodiversity framework. Uh, as Marcel already said, this policy brief is also the result of a collaboration of researchers from the UN University Institute and the Satoyama Initiative, the Wageningen and Center for Development and Innovation and the organization where I work, PBL, Netherlands Environmental Assessment Agency. And we are glad to have this opportunity to gather some feedback from a broad audience on our key ideas that we aim to broadcast to the upcoming CBD meetings resulting finally in the design of a new global biodiversity framework. So as Marcel already uh, shared some background, I just thought it was also good to provide a little bit of it. Uh, as, as we all hope that the year 2020 was supposed to be the super year for biodiversity as it marks both the end of the current strategic framework and also the end of the UN decade for biodiversity. You can of course wonder if this provides much reason for celebration, because last year the IBES Global Assessment Report showed that over the last four to five decades, biodiversity and ecosystem services are deteriorating worldwide. 
and the impacts from direct and indirect drivers of change like land use and climate change, population dynamics and trade and consumptions have only accelerated. And just about a month ago, the CBD reported in its fifth global biodiversity outlook uh, about the progress on these so-called Aichi biodiversity targets that were set in 2010. The report concluded that while progress was made on some individual goals, none of the 20 targets has been fully achieved. And this includes also targets related to the vital contributions of indigenous peoples and local communities, which was reported by the related Local Biodiversity Outlooks 2 report. Anticipating these messages, the latest conference of the party meeting in 2018 had two important outcomes, a roadmap for the development of the new ambitious strategic framework towards 2030 and the launch of the action agenda for nature and people. This action agenda was especially aimed to raise public awareness on biodiversity and also to promote stronger involvement and commitment by non-state and subnational actors, as Marcel said, for instance, including cities, businesses and local governments. These activities will build momentum towards the next conference of the parties in Kunming next year. The post-2020 roadmap has by now culminated into a zero draft document describing the proposed framework. The framework that is built on a theory of change as illustrated by the image on the left that aims to bring a transformation of society's relationship with biodiversity and to ensure that by 2050, the CBD vision of living in harmony with nature is fulfilled. So while involving the whole of government, meaning various levels of government, and the whole of society, meaning including all actors in society, the framework proposes a number of goals to reduce the various threats to biodiversity and to ensure sustainable use of biodiversity to meet people's needs. So how ambitious these goals will be is currently, of course, under debate and negotiations, but recent research suggests that high level ambitions are actually needed to bend the curve for biodiversity. Achieving transformative change needed for realizing this also means to move away from the business as usual ways of doing things today. The framework intends to align with the SDGs and the climate goal. Therefore, the collaboration between sectors is essential in order to create the required synergies for biodiversity from more sustainable consumption and production of sufficient and healthy food and the mitigation of climate change. As most of these challenges are managed at the scale of landscapes, it is actually worrying to me that the concept of landscape approaches is not yet part of this framework and the underlying theory of change. Because because if there is one concept that has gained much interest in the last decade for recognizing the multifunctionality of landscapes, integrate, integrating its multiple values and trying to work across sectors, then landscape approaches seem to align very well with the ambition and vision for the CBD framework. As most of you probably here already know that broadly uh, landscape approaches could be defined as a long-term collaborative process bringing together diverse stakeholders aiming to achieve a balance between multiple and sometimes conflicting land objectives in the land or seascape. Given that this is a very diverse group, we refer to landscape governance arrangements as the broad collection of place-based multi-stakeholder initiatives of dialogue and decision-making for sustainable land use. So following this, what is the opportunity that landscape approaches and arrangement provide for the new CBD framework? By principle, they aim to achieve societal transformative change by involving multiple stakeholders and integrating sectors in a bottom-up and participatory way. This supports the ambition to simultaneously achieve a wide range of objectives, including biodiversity and also in a holistic and integrated approach. This again generates opportunities for designing more nature-inclusive development pathways they are complementary to existing ecosystem approaches, not only just for adding the holistic human perspective and using adaptive and iterative management, but especially also for covering multiple ecosystems, including the importance of biodiversity in the managed ones. They can support the implementation of other effective area-based conservation measures and provide to me, I think the essential perspective for the successful implementation and also high biodiversity value of restoration activities and nature-based solutions that are gaining more and more interest. And last but not least, many landscape initiatives are connected to international networks for knowledge sharing, of which you see a number of logos here on the right. 
and they do that for knowledge sharing, dialogue, and also to connect to global financial institutions. So while some operate more closely to the CBD than others, the new network, the new framework should really benefit from the potential these networks offer for achieving transformative change and the con conservation and sustainable use of biodiversity. Vice versa, I think these networks should also resonate a collaborative message on this potential to watch the CBD process developing the framework. As combined call to action, I believe the forum, this forum provides an excellent opportunity for doing that. So how do we think the CBD could seize this opportunity? In order to achieve transformative change involving the whole of society that will address the direct and especially the indirect drivers of biodiversity loss, the new framework could improve the underlying theory of change by embedding the holistic and iterative principles advocated by landscape approaches. Also, the framework could explicitly mention the importance of the landscape perspective, especially when referring to the fundamental vice versa dependencies with the sustainable development goals. When looking at the goals and targets in the draft framework, it is clear that landscape approaches and initiatives and arrangements can contribute to realizing many of them in a participatory way. With respect to reducing threats to biodiversity in managing the protection and connectivity of natural areas, the improvement and development of participatory spatial planning processes and finding synergies with nature-based solutions focusing on dealing with climate change. With respect to Managing nature's contributions to people, they promote sustainable use of biodiversity in support of improving agricultural production, the availability of clean water and management of green blue infrastructures. The ambition to find integration across multiple sectors contributes to enhance horizontal and vertical mainstreaming of biodiversity, also into planning and development processes. Building capacities and promoting the participation of multiple stakeholders in platforms and cooperatives increases societal inclusiveness constituting an important enabling conditions for the framework and which last but not least also promote the full and effective participation of indigenous peoples and local communities including their knowledge and practices so concluding we come to the following key messages landscape approaches initiatives and arrangements can contribute <clears throat> an essential element of the new cbd biodiversity framework involving the whole of society in order to achieve transformative biodiversity governance. Second, the new CBD global biodiversity framework should recognize the role of landscape approaches, initiatives and arrangements as important non-state actor contributions that facilitate in achieving the 2030 mission and realizing the 2050 vision in living in harmony with nature. The new CBD global biodiversity framework should also promote policies and mechanisms that support landscape initiatives and arrangement in realizing their opportunity to achieve transformative biodiversity governance. I hope at least that the following presentations will provide also inspiration for realizing landscape level non-state actor commitments for biodiversity to the CBD. So for now, I thank you for your attention. Thank you, Johan. Some uh, clear messages, um, and I hand over to uh, Sunita for the interactive bit. Yeah, thanks, 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 Johan. Thanks, Marshall. Um, MJ, if you could put up the question, uh, the slide for Johan. Yeah, so, so if you could poll, could landscape initiatives contribute through the action agenda for nature and people by making commitments? So can landscape initiatives actually make specific biodiversity commitments and contribute thereby to the action agenda for nature and people? Okay. Most people think that it is possible. Perhaps. And yes, and, and maybe we should take it up during discussion on what the action agenda actually is. Mm. And we'll do that. 
yeah. MJ, could you go to the, no, we only have one, one slide. Uh, no, there's one more. Can you go to the next? No, fine. Okay. Just the previous one, MJ. This was for the next speaker. Okay. <clears throat> we have a, uh, we have at least one question that we'd like Johan to reflect on. Um, Johan, so why would you, uh, uh, through the course of your presentation, you did make this point that we look at landscape initiatives um, as non-state actors and the initiatives are also as actions um, as well as policy instruments that can contribute towards biodiversity policy. Why do you think it is important that we should consider it this way? Uh, yeah, yeah, good question. Um, yeah, I think uh, one important thing is that there has been a large review of landscape initiatives over various continents and that have shown that non-state actors are often the driving force behind them. And this could range from local communities to NGOs and also supply chain actors, for instance, uh, introducing certification scheme. And of course, they often interact and collaborate with government actors. But uh, given the outcome of this review, that the main incentive of most of these uh, landscape initiatives was conservation, I would say that makes them, of course, interesting for biodiversity uh, policy in particular. And I guess governments could use that potential, especially when these initiatives operate in landscape, for instance, where government support or enforcement capacity is absent or maybe not as well developed as we hope. Um, and that's that, I mean, effective, participatory, inclusive collaboration can bring a lot, but of course it also needs to be met by political will to make these topics a real priority. And mm. I hope also, for instance, that embedding this clearly in the CBD global framework will guide the agenda, that, that this framework will guide the agenda on these policies for the next decade. So I hope this is at least one important way to improve this. Thanks, Johan. Um, I noted that there is, an, uh, there is a question on transformative governance, but we'll take it up during the final Q&A session, if that's okay. Yep, yep. Yeah. Um, so over to you, Marcel, for the next speaker. Yes, uh, our next speaker would have been John Ajuko, uh, or is John Ajuko from uh, Hoarek and uh, African Landscapes Dialogue. Um, however, uh, as he can't make it online, uh, we will have his uh, contribution broadcasted. And I believe, Johan, you're going to put that on, right? Yep, yep. My name is uh, John Ajugo. I work for Horn of Africa Regional Environment Center and, and Network. And I have uh, a great pleasure to participate in reflecting on how landscape initiative can actually contribute to post-2020 biodiversity framework. And my presentation here is to highlight the potential of these landscape initiatives and also community engagement as it uh, helps in uh, promoting biodiversity conservation. And to do this, I want to look at the uh, African landscape dialogue uh, during which we came up with the policy document, the policy recommendation. And also, I will also look at the experiences from Oric that has been involved in uh, engaging communities to implement landscape initiatives. African Landscape Dialogue, as we know, it is really a forum that brings together institutions and uh, practitioners to share experiences on landscape initiatives. And the one in Arusa, in uh, Arusa happened in November 2019, during which a team developed a policy, policy recommendations you know, on how integrated landscape management can contribute to the CBD post-2020 biodiversity framework. There are 10 policy recommendations, but I just want to highlight five 
One is to support and strengthen long-term and locally led area-based landscape initiatives. There was also the recommendation to manage agricultural system for biodiversity conservation. As we know, a lot of biodiversity resources depend on these agricultural areas. There is a consideration to integrate biodiversity conservation in urban planning. As we know, it also a lot of urban areas have river systems and wetlands. And a lot of wetlands, these wetlands are being drained you know, to, to erect buildings and thereby depriving the urban community you know, from recreational activities that come with the, comes with the biodiversity conservation. The fourth, the, the fourth was the need to set landscape biodiversity targets so that when we implement landscape initiatives, we know that at the end of the project, there are certain tar targets that we need to achieve that are relevant to biodiversity and conservation. And then the fifth that I want to highlight is also the need to build local skills and invest in, invest in community resource centers. Uh, a key example of community resource center has been the Lalenok, which has been established by Source Rift Association of Landowners. And this has become quite a, a rich area for knowledge generation on community resource management practices. And these are uh, areas that need to be supported. So when you look at uh, economic stakes that are, that are really active in supporting biodiversity conservation, one, one example that comes to mind is Social Rift Association of Landowners. You know, this is an association that has managed to put together quite a vast piece of area or community area into conservancies. Yeah. And now this is being managed you know, to provide critical corridors between Amboseli and Masai Mara. And to date, this has become also a rich area for wildlife because a lot of species of elephant and other species have actually come back into these areas in, in great numbers, more than in some of the protected areas. So this, for me, is a very positive approach to community engagement that supports biodiversity conservation directly. We also have initiatives of network like HOREC in the Horn of Africa that is engaging community in managing bio, uh, landscape uh, initiatives. And these initiatives, initiatives focus on also restoration, uh, landscape restoration activities, including also livelihood and research, research and also engaging in even uh, business, business community that are present in the, in the last camp, you know, to, to, to get their support in the biodiversity conservation, conservation activities, landscape restoration issues and all that. So there are also NGOs in conservation that are also really supporting community and bridging the gap between community area, but also areas that, are, that can serve also biology, assess biology, biological corridors for species to move from one resource rich area to another. So landscape unicity, when you look at it, the entry points are many. And some are using integrated water management approaches. There are those that are also using biological corridors. You know, there are those that are really practical using, uh, looking at also carving areas that contain micro uh, wildlife migration from one country to another. A good example is between the migration between South Sudan and Ethiopia, where over a million white eco migration migration takes place across vast areas, you know, from protected areas to community land, you know, and uh, and, and these areas require quite protection, and, you know, you know, through community engagement. So if you look at uh, the integrated landscape management prospect and gains, there are quite many because landscape approach by nature covers vast areas of different range of habitats, ranging from forest, grassland, wetlands, some are even semi-arid arid areas. There are some even settlement areas, urban landscape, agricultural systems are also covered in these kind of areas. So this, for me, embodies the true meaning of mainstream biodiversity conservation in, in, in all sectors and areas of activity, especially through projects and activity and programming. 
So when you look at uh, the gains of community engagement, you know, the, it's, it's quite huge because in Namibia, you talk of about 86 community conservancies created out of community land. And this constitutes about 90% of community land put under wildlife conservation, which previously was not the case. You look at Kenya also with about 160 conservancies and 11% of community areas are now placed under conservation, more than formal protected area, which is just 80%, 88%. So in the conservancies in Kenya, particularly the one of Source Rift, it provides quite a very good corridor now for, for species between two protected areas, the Amboseli and Masai Mara. That for me is a rich, an example of how community engagement can actually support can support this post-2020 biodiversity conservation framework. So Horek, Horek has a, a rich experience of dealing with transboundary uh, ecosystems that are shared between countries. Because when you look at uh, the vantage point of Ethiopia, let's say it is it's quite for Horn of Africa, the hydrological systems this country provides to the rest of the home country is, is quite huge. And this requires quite a management approaches that brings together CAs and con con communities and uh, government institutions from these different countries into one platform to manage these resources together you know, as a regional block. So when you look at uh, the movement of also of wildlife species across these borders, like between South Sudan and Ethiopia, the only way you can manage this is really through landscape approach, but of course it passes through protected areas and community areas, which requires the participation of active participation of community in managing these resources. So one active project we are now managing is this transboundary socio-ecological project that combines uh, three countries within which you have about nine national parks that are really embodied within this uh, landscape. It's a vast piece of an area. But when you look at it, we want to achieve landscape resolution and results, results that relates to food security, also energy security, demand-driven action research, and also engage this public-private partnership because there are a lot of business interests in this landscape. And this is where now you have about, you know, about four, four community-based organizations that are leading this project. Together, of course, in the areas of protected areas, we bring on board also Protected Management Authority that would also be working with this community-based organization to implement some of the project that directly relates to the protected area. And this is a way of actually also taking pressures away from these areas through project activities so that when community access these areas for resources, you know, then you create business opportunities, organize groups to manage natural resources then less pressure is actually exerted on the protected area and this in this way you end up supporting biodiversity conservation but also you're also looking at uh, awareness raising because the full range of the project will just be talking about sustainability environmental issues biodiversity and the more you talk about this the more it sinks in the mind of the communities the importance of why these areas are actually critical and once you develop it to a greater extent it will also create some business opportunities around populism, and this begins to show the relevance of why conservation activities in this area is, is relevant for communities. In Hauric uh, has quite a rich experience of you know, doing quite other research areas, like now in Djibouti, we have our network member engaged in vulture attacking. Recently, there, there's also this uh, Somali Sengi elephant group species that has been just radically discovered, you know, after disappearing from science for about 50 years. So this for me is an area where landscape approach becomes critical because if it was not the landscape approach, then you will not be able to access these areas to, to, to get these species. Then with this, maybe we can see the prospect of area-based approaches, you know, as an opportunity to for community engagement on sustainable natural resource management, but also also providing their role in biodiversity conservation. 
or the central question to us is are achievements from this initiative, the ILM initiatives, being captured and reported in national or global reporting systems? And if so, how is this being done? Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, John, for this presentation, although you're not here with us. The, John, is, as I said before, uh, in the field in Turkana, wasn't able to, uh, for technical reasons, to attend the session. That's why we broadcasted it. And I think he, uh, he uh, asked a very pertinent question of uh, to what extent all the initiatives that he is working on uh, are actually recognized in national and international reporting systems. And I think uh, uh, often that that is not the case. And, Part of the issues we want to discuss here today is to, to make the connections between the, the local perspective and the uh, national and global perspective. Um, Sunita, over to you, please. Thanks, Marcia. Uh, indeed. So uh, we, yeah, MJ is showing us, we have a slide or question for you based on, uh, on John's presentation. Um, unfortunately, he's not around to take any questions, but... Um, but if you do have any, we could always get back uh, to him if, if it's required. Um, and if there are ones that can be dealt with in the last um, Q&A discussion session, we can do that too. So the question for Slido is, and this one is not a poll question, so we would like you to give us a response on your, on, on, on your, uh, based on your opinion. How does community engagement help? to conserve biodiversity in landscape initiatives. As we've already started receiving inputs, so learn practices from indigenous and local communities and provide tools for improvement by raising awareness of the value of biodiversity and providing benefits and services. It increases Yeah, it increases ownership, the sense of ownership over the uh, system, better education, better buy-in from local. <laughs> yeah, that's a... Um, that's an interesting take that, the, that, that there can be no uh, landscape initiative without, without community engagement. But at the same time, there are all of these various dimensions that, that, that resonate with different sets of actors and, and based on our own experiences that we think um, uh, are valuable lessons to be learned by having a more inclusive and participatory approach. Hmm. These are really interesting it's commercial incentives that encourage landscapes and communities to thrive together. Uh -huh. Excellent. Community lives and lands lives in landscape and has vested interests in landscape health. Yeah, so you speak directly to self-interest uh, and sustainability goals at the local level by engaging with the local actors. Okay, I'm going to, um, to, to close the Slido now, uh, but, we, but, but these are, I think, I think we're getting some really brilliant responses here, and 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 in some way we should we should try and summarize uh, what's what's coming in. Also, there are some experiences that are being shared, which we think our partners um, would be very interested to to perhaps uh, yeah discuss about later on offline. Um, yeah, similar initiatives in similar contexts. Okay, thank you everyone.
Thanks, Marshall. Over to you. Yeah. Thanks, Anita. Um, Johan, are you sharing the presentation? Yes, then I'm happy to uh, uh, present uh, the next speaker, which is uh, Michael Nishu. She's a research fellow at the United Nations University uh, at the Institute for uh, Advanced Studies for Sustainability and also working uh, with the Satoyama Initiatives. And in her presentation, she will focus how national biodiversity policies can uh, benefit from and promote landscape initiatives, especially through uh, the MBSEP process uh, with uh, the CBD. Michael, over to you. Thank you very much for our introduction and also thank you very much for giving me the opportunity to talk about our, um, our work on the landscape approaches. Our, our institute, UNUIS, is one of the 14 institutes of United Nations University are engaging in the policy-oriented research and capacity development on the issues of sustainability. So, but my talk uh, will focus on the linkages between landscape approaches and national biodiversity policy. Um, but we have been working on the landscape approaches uh, together with the diverse stakeholders at the multiple scale and levels. So moving on. Um, so we have been promoting the Satoyama Initiative uh, that was jointly initiated by UNU and also Minister of the Environment in Japan as a global effort to realize society in harmony with nature. So in order to implement the concept and also vision of the Satoyama Initiative, uh, IPSI International Partnership for the Satoyama Initiative uh, was launched during the CBD COP10 in 2010. Uh, so this is a global platform to promote networking and collaboration on the management of socio-ecological production landscapes and seascapes. So particularly to contribute to the CBD's second objective, uh, which is sustainable use and biodiversity. And start having started with 51 uh, founding organizations, uh, this partnership now consists of uh, 267 uh, member organizations, including national, local governments, NGOs, private sector, academic institutions, and also our local communities and indigenous people uh, who are dedicated to work together uh, to foster synergies in the implementation of their respective activities. And moving on, uh, next slide, please. <clears throat> So serving as a secretary for this partnership, uh, we have been collecting and analyzing and disseminating the information knowledge on uh, landscape and, and seascapes, uh, ba particularly based on the case studies uh, submitted by the member organization around the world. And having uh, worked on the various types of landscape and seascapes, uh, we have recognized the importance of upscaling uh, on the ground um, initiatives to have a broader impact and even facilitate the systemic change towards sustainability. And, and at the same time, uh, we have recognized the potentials of landscape approaches uh, to be applied uh, in the policy processes. So as to have the greater policy impact uh, finally coming down to the ground in practice. And moving on, uh, so given the integrative nature, uh, we see the potential of landscape approaches, um, particularly to promote um, a sustainable use and mainstreaming of biodiversity. Uh, when they are applied and used to the process of national biodiversity strategies and action plans, NBSAPs. And as you might know, uh, NBSAPs are mandated in the Article 6 of the Convention or to serve as the main instrument for the CBD implementation at the national level. So they are, are intended to offer a roadmap for the each party uh, to integrate biodiversity consideration into national uh, decision making and also to mainstream the biodiversity issue across all sectors. So as you can see this figure, um, among um, 196 uh, parties to the CBD, uh, most of the, almost all the party have already developed at least one NBSAP. As, and also the great majority of parties have uh, also taken into account the bi uh, strategic plan for biodiversity from 2011 to 2020, uh, including IG biodiversity targets in their NBSAPs. However, uh, in their expectation to the post 2020 framework, uh, many of the parties have expressed the needs to uh, strengthen the NBSAP process, uh, particularly the implementation of NBSAPs. So actually the implementation is a big challenge to be overcome in the uh, coming decade. 
So moving on. Uh, so uh, keeping these trends in mind, uh, we started joint research project uh, in 2016. So this research project is uh, being conducted in cooperation with the University of Tokyo under the support of the CBD Secretariat and also the Minister of the Environment Japan. So the project aims to reconceptualize landscape approaches in the context of CBD implementation, particularly through NBCEPs and also are to analyze and validate the applicabilities of landscape approaches to the NBSAP process. And in this study, uh, we found that some relevant concepts like uh, cultural landscapes and also related characteristics like uh, local knowledge and human nature interactions have been um, actually well um, described and referred uh, in the NBSAP documents. However, specific indicators and also budget allocation for implementation have not been well uh, included in the NVSAP. And only, um, actually only a few projects are referenced in the NVSAP documents, although there are several projects actually going on on the ground uh, by applying the landscape approaches in the work. So, and also recent with a survey for the national focal points of CBD uh, found that um, many policy administrators in church of NBSAPs have seen the potential of landscape approaches, particularly in regard to biodiversity mainstreaming and multi-stakeholder engagement, addressing cross-cutting issues and also contribution to the global biodiversity targets. But they are also concerned of some challenges like a lack of funding and a continued stakeholder commitment and engagement and suggesting some needs for capacity development to effectively apply landscape approaches in the policy processes. And moving on. So in the context of CBD implementation, uh, we see the landscape approaches as space-based strategies to put theory into practice particularly through the place-based coordination attending to uh, local knowledge and also context-specific uh, conditions. And also by taking a realistic view to reconcile competing needs and demands, uh, including inevitable trade-offs, uh, we see the uh, landscape approaches allow for more equitable processes uh, leading to sound and ethical uh, decision-making processes and outcome. And also uh, entailing iterative learning processes uh, with involvement of diverse stakeholders, uh, we see that approaches would help to uh, effectively mobilize resources and facilitate capacity development among the different st uh, stakeholders, including non-state actors are working on the ground and also coming from different sectors. And also this iterative learning process um, allows for or better addressing future challenges involving a great level of uncertainties. And next slide, please. <clears throat> so in order to take advantage of uh, landscape approaches to uh, revise and update and also implement and be uh, for the post 2020 period, um, we are now uh, developing a technical manual to be used as a practical reference by the national policy administrators in charge of NBSAPs. So our once the post-2020 framework is adopted at the CBD COP15 next year, uh, many parties would need to revise and update their NBSAPs uh, to, incorporate, in, to incorporate the uh, new biodiversity targets. So this manual is being prepared uh, um, to help parties to better understand the concept and theories of landscape approaches and also learn some good practices and ex experiences uh, from other countries and regions. And this manual is also to offer some step-by-step -step guidance um, along with the process, uh, particularly in the context of uh, post-2020 framework. And then uh, moving on. So uh, finally, our, our study and also experiences suggest that uh, NBSAPs and also any other good policy uh, cannot be implemented without uh, multiple stakeholders who actually operate and use and also manage land, uh, resources in the landscape and seascapes. And also NBSAPs uh, can take advantage of landscape approaches uh, that uh, provide some useful framework and schemes to uh, contextualize um, adaptive uh, co um, adaptive co-management. So the approaches allow or for 
uh, to effectively mobilize resources and also facilitate both policy making and also implementation uh, toward the 2050 vision for biodiversity aiming at living in harmony with nature. So this is also in line with uh, the vision of Satoyama Initiative. And from now on, uh, we are, are going to finalize the manual uh, to be aligned with the new post-2020 framework. And by using this manual, we are also planning to undertake some uh, capacity development activities so that uh, CBD parties can better uptake the landscape approaches to have greater policy impact on the ground, finally. And thank you very much for your kind attention. Uh, that's it for me. Thank you. Thanks, Michael. Very interesting. And uh, all of you in the audience who is interested to, to learn more about and applying the, uh, the manual, uh, please get in touch with, uh, with Michael uh, on this. Um, Sunita, over to you with the uh, interactive question. Yeah, thank, yeah. <laughs> thanks, uh, Marcel. Uh, MJ, the Slido. Okay, so we have a, a, a couple of uh, Slido questions and then actually a few questions for Michael. Um, so the, the poll question is, do you know about the National Biodiversity Strategy and Action Plans of your own country, that is, either the country of your residence or your nationality? How well do you know this? Ooh. Okay. Okay, so this is, we're almost, okay, we're evenly balanced between people who do know. Okay, it's changing still. Okay, I guess that's stabilized. No. Well, yeah, most of us are unaware, seem to be unaware of, of, uh, of whether the country has an NBSAP. Well, almost all countries who are, mem well, which is nearly universal, members to the CBD have at least um, adopted one at least one NBSAP. So yes, your country should be having one, but an updated one is much more rich in a lot of content as required by more recent developments within the Convention on Biological Diversity. So it would be useful to see what, what it contains. Well, we hope it, it does make you curious to go and have a look at, look at what the country's NBSAP says. Okay. Um, I think that's the only poll we have for Michael, right? Uh, for, for this presentation. Uh, MJ, could you just go to the next uh, question? No. Yeah, you can go back, MJ, thank you. So we have, uh, Michael, we have two questions um, uh, for you. The first actually relates to the point that we've been making about biodiversity commitments from non-state actors. And given um, that you have quite a large network of partners within the International Partnership for the Satoyama Initiative, do you see that there is potential amongst these partners to make biodiversity commitments that are aligned with the uh, global biodiversity framework objectives? That's the first one. And then I'll ask you the second. Uh, yes, and thank you very much for the important question. Um, yes, I, in general, yes. So because um, by becoming the member organization, um, IPC partners have already uh, committed to work together and create synergies among the members so as to realize society in harmony with nature, which is the vision of the Satyama Initiative. And particularly in the application form uh, to become a member, so they need to show uh, how their activities are relevant to the concept of the Satoyama Initiative, and also how they can uh, contribute to their uh, strategic objectives of the IPSI. 
um, for example, like uh, gener knowledge generation and knowledge sharing and also addressing some um, key driver for biodiversity loss and also enhancing benefits from the productive landscape and seascapes. So uh, there are great potential actually to uh, enhance the commitment and through the partnership, particularly uh, by complementing each other and some filling some gap in the expertise and capacity uh, through their collaboration among the members. Um, but at, same, at the same time, I think it would be a challenge to how to make the commitment uh, more sustainable and continued. And finally, um, kind of leading to the uh, transformative change uh, to, towards sustainability. So um, I think, uh, in fact, actually, some um, many case studies actually are, have shown uh, the seeds of change uh, that are emerging, but not uh, yet to be um, broad or strong enough to actually bring a real uh, transformative change uh, on a broader scale. So uh, I think it's a um, um, kind of a, a big agenda uh, in the coming year uh, to discuss and explore together with the partner uh, to find out a way to actually uh, strengthen the commitment and also make it uh, more continued and also impactful uh, to uh, give rise to the transformative change. Yeah, uh, that is what I think and I'm hoping. Yeah, thanks, Michael. So there is promise uh, and we have to see how that, that pans out. Yeah, good luck. Um, Thank you. Yeah, I have a second question for you. And that's directly related to the manual that, that you spoke about. Um, so could you indicate uh, broadly when this manual will be published and how can it be made, how will it be made accessible to people who may be interested to read it or even use the manual for various purposes? Uh, yes, um, so as I mentioned, so the project itself is still going on. And as uh, particularly, we need to make sure that the contents of manual uh, should be in line with the new uh, um, post 2020 framework. So uh, the manual will be finalized after uh, CBD COP 15, uh, where the new global biodiversity targets will be finally determined. Um, but the, once the new uh, targets will be determined, uh, we assume that many parties will start revising and updating the uh, NVSAPs. Uh, so we try to make the manual available and useful for such a process. And but uh, we also still need some time to uh, go through some external review and also make it uh, more uh, available for several different languages. So uh, I think uh, it will be a make available publicly uh, toward the end of next year or uh, possibly early 2022. Um, so, but I think uh, it also depends on uh, how soon the COP15 will be actually held. So, but uh, in any case, but manual will be made available freely online um, for the access by a broader range of users, not only um, the CBD parties, but also any interested in, uh, users and the stakeholders. So I'm sure that the CBT secretary will also help us to disseminate uh, the information, knowledge, uh, and also uh, materials um, of the manual. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. So again, as Marshall mentioned in the beginning, if people have uh, want more information about uh, this particular work, please feel free to get in touch with Michael. Marcel, the floor is yours to introduce Nina and the speaker. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Uh... Thank you, Michael, for your presentation. Uh, we quickly move on to uh, the presentation from uh, Nina Bola. She is a senior program manager at the UN Environment World Conservation Monitoring Center. Uh, and she will inform us uh, about an initiative to develop a platform for area-based conservation uh, uh, commitments for biodiversity. And of course, this is a very important issue if through an action agenda, uh, commitments are going to be collected. Somehow these have to be uh, showcased and Nina the floor is yours. Great thank you Marcel and good morning everyone and thanks for having me. Um, I work at the United Nations Environment Program World Conservation Monitoring Center. We're based in Cambridge. Um, today I'd just like to take the time to present a new initiative that's being led by UNAP WCMC and EarthMind with support from the Dutch government 
to develop a platform module that aims to capture uh, area-based commitments to showcase what people have committed to doing in the future. And the development of this platform module is in the context of the Sharm El Sheikh to Kunming Action Agenda for Nature and People that we've just heard about. Um, it's basically an initiative that was launched by the governments in Egypt and China at the COP CBD 14 in 2018, where countries agreed to encourage non-state actors to develop commitments that contribute to the achievement of the CBD objectives. And it was a place for them to showcase these commitments on an online platform designed for that purpose. Next, please. Um, so to provide some context, we know that there's an increasing recognition of environmental problems. And with that should come an increasing willingness to act. So there's been long recognition that the combined actions of state and non-state actors, including subnational actors such as cities, um, indigenous peoples and local communities, companies, civil society organizations are all critical to achieving ambitious goals for biodiversity and sustainability. But we know that actions made can take many forms, of course, ranging from improving education to research and awareness, all the way through to establishing protection and conser con conserving areas. And when aggregated, these actions have the potential to support a range of benefits for nature and people. But looking forward, as the next generation of global biodiversity goals evolves as part of the post-2020 framework, we know that future commitments are needed, and we know that they're likely to increase also in number and in scale, but it will be even more important that these commitments are sufficiently ambitious, but also grounded in the best available knowledge in order to deliver the desired biodiversity outcomes. Next, please. So, just to bring the focus down a little bit more to area-based actions, we know that there are areas where people are taking action um, as shown by these knowledge platforms here, such as Protected Planet, which is an initiative that's managed by UNFWCMC and IUCN. It underpins the World Database on Protected Areas and the World Database on other effective area-based conservation measures. We also have uh, the ICCA registry, which showcases areas that are being conserved by indigenous peoples and community conserved territories and areas. So these are platforms that exist to show where people are currently taking action. But the problem is that we don't know enough about where future commitments are being made by non-state actors. And there's actually no clear mechanism to capture them. And this means that we're unable to provide a representative overview of the area-based commitments in places, as well as across landscapes, that could contribute towards delivery of positive biodiversity outcomes. And so we want to change that by building an online platform module that will be complementary and linked to the existing action agenda, but will be focused thematically with the aim to capture area-based commitments, which are an important cross-cutting element of sustainable use and biodiversity across all sectors. Moving on. So we've recently embarked on this new initiative, like I said earlier, being led by UFWCMC and EarthMind, with support from the Dutch government, to develop a platform that captures a wide range of forward-looking, long-term area-based commitments. And the core cool part of the development of the platform is that it aims to capture both new and improving existing area-based measures. So improving the management of an area, improving the governance of an area, improving the connectivity of an area. Um, so both new and improved uh, measures that contribute to one or more of the objectives of the CBD. So that includes biodiversity conservation, sustainable use, and equitable sharing of benefits from genetic resources. So the platform will be designed to complement the Sharm El Sheikh to Kunming Action Agenda, and we're working very closely with the CBD Secretariat to do this. 
Um, and it will be designed in a way that allows for expansion to cover a wider set of thematic commitments in the future as required. So it could even cover modules such as species or sustainable use. Those are still to be decided, but the whole idea is to have a credible and transparent platform where non-state actors can showcase the good work that they're doing. Um, and we want this to be uh, in a very collaborative way. So in July, we hosted a first brainstorming meeting to explore a number of areas of how we could develop such a platform. We had excellent participation and we also talked about many um, the, the need to have very strong collaboration and um, we're currently exploring opportunities to engage with many of you. Um, and just on this point, we're now really consolidating all the information that we've received so far and are developing a prototype of the platform module to present at the second. We, we, we will have the second brainstorming meeting um, with that. We will integrate further feedback with the aim of presenting or launching this at the CBD COP15 next year. Next slide, please. Just to give you a quick, quick idea of um, the types of commitments we're looking through, looking for, I'll just show you an example here. The area of Kwatmuk, it's in Canada, and it's traditionally been managed by Indigenous peoples. But after enduring a long history of decade long fights between developers, it's actually now seeking permanent protection. So to become a protected area. And the goal is for Kwatmuk Indigenous Protected and Conserved Area to be formally established by mid 2021. And there are many examples like this under a diverse range of governance types that we hope to capture in a systematic and a credible way. Next slide. So just bringing this back to the landscape approach, although a landscape is a single environment system, human systems of governance at the landscape scale are often fragmented across different jurisdictions and a diverse range of stakeholders like we've already heard today, which can sometimes impede coordinated planning to maintain biodiversity. So these individual area-based commitments such as establishing ecological corridors or targeting protection of species or restoration of forests, they really should be considered in future planning across the landscape in order to maintain system-wide ecological functions, as well as offering a possibility of mutually reinforcing goals, for example, climate change mitigation. Uh, final, final slide. So this, Area-based platform really offers, in the future, a place to promote and showcase a groundswell of commitments from non-state actors. It's a place to raise awareness, to share lessons learned, including successes and failures, from other area-based approaches across the world, and a place to be inspired in a way that catalyzes further commitments. And this is a pivotal time, really, for not only recognizing the good work that is already happening, but also ensuring that commitments that are being made in the future are intended to maximize positive impact and contribute to achieving the long term CBD 2050 vision of living in harmony with nature. And yeah, just lastly, I'd be delighted to hear from you in order to make this initiative useful and impactful and invite you to get in touch with me to explore how we can collaborate further. Um, thank you for your attention and thank you for having me here. Thank you. Thank you, Nina. Uh, yeah, thank you. Uh, I think uh, your initiative is actually one of the answers uh, on the question John raised at the end of his presentation is how are the local initiatives going to be reported at national and global levels? And, I think this is a way to to bring to the forefront uh, as many initiatives that are happening and that may be recognized. But uh, Sunita, over to you. Yeah, so let's do a quick round with the Slido. Um, um, so the first quest, poll question is, would you consider registering your initiative at this platform? Yes, great. Can you go to the next? Nina, that's great news. Okay. 
<laughs> what would you see uh, benefits for you to use this platform? Opportunity to share lessons and celebrate successes. Opportunities to learn from other actions, to inspire investors or donors to support specific initiatives and contribute to enhance the data available for indicators of progress towards global area-based biodiversity targets. Okay. Yeah, the biggest, um, okay, it's overriding. Huh? It's, it's all about the learning, the first two. So it's about sharing and learning and, and that's, that's definitely important. Next, uh, MJ. I'm sorry, I'm just being mindful of the time. And who do you think are the key user groups who are expected to benefit most from the platform? So this is for you to type in. And as people are typing in, Nina, can I ask you a question? Uh, so the platform uh, itself is not um, is not active yet, right? Um, so when when would it when would it come live? And do you have any criteria for people to submit area based commitments um, when they make these commitments, Nina? So, yeah, thanks, Sanika. The platform is obviously very new. We're still in the design prototype stage. Um, of course, the timelines have been shifted um, due to the, the COVID impact. Um, but the current plan is to develop the prototype pl platform in early 2021 with the aim of launching it at COP15. Um, but we have a lot to do before then, and perhaps the most important thing for us to do is to build strong partnerships to ensure that this platform is designed to benefit the users um, and is supported and sustained in the long term. Uh, for the second question in terms of criteria, yes, we definitely have criteria. Um, we want this to be as inclusive as possible, um, but we do need some sort of criteria that would guide uh, data providers to include commitments in this platform. So they will just be used as a guide, not a prescriptive uh, set of criteria. And the criteria will just basically serve to ensure that this, you know, the suitability and alignment of the commitment. So it, it meets the purpose of the platform. Um, it facilitates transparency. The criteria are important in terms of facilitating transparency and to some degree, soft accountability where we would also develop a function to encourage uh, the data provider to submit updates to the commitment as they progress along. Um, and, you know, with enhancing credibility of the commitment and visibility to the non-state actors, and these are kind of the criteria I mentioned earlier would be long-term, would be um, forward-looking. Uh, they wouldn't be so prescriptive, but still enough to identify that these are place-based measures with a defined specific area. And so in future, we can aggregate numbers and say there's, you know, a thousand hectares of restoration area being committed to in this particular area. So we would try to find a, a way to aggregate those commitments as well. So definitely we need criteria um, okay. to ensure uh, it's relevant to the CBD objectives in the long term. Yeah. Great. Thanks, Nina. Uh, MJ, if you could just um, show the last uh, Slido responses. So the, the key user groups most likely to benefit um, opinions are researchers, policymakers, yeah, and a policy platform like the CBD itself. Interesting. Yeah? And local people. Okay. Yeah, I was wondering, they seem to be missing, although that was the whole intent of the whole platform. Yeah, great. Um, thank you, Nina. And I'm going to hand over to Marcel uh, for uh, introducing our last presenter um, before we do a quick uh, panel discussion. Yeah. 
Yes, thanks. Um, well, last but not least, and thanks for uh, being patient. Uh, Sophie Percy, she is with Landscale and the Rainforest Alliance, and she will present uh, the Landscale in, uh, initiative uh, that will help us to, to showcase and uh, ensure uh, the, the credibility of uh, Landscale initiatives to a platform, uh, as Nina just has described. Sophie, over to you. Thanks very much, Johan. Um, okay, so yeah, thank you so much for the opportunity to talk to you today about Landscale. Um, this is really timely because we just released um, a new version of Landscale just two days ago. So you can visit www.landscale.org to see more of the documents and learn more about, um, go into more detail about the different things I'm gonna give you a high level overview on. So um, let's get started. Um, so although I am based with Rainforest Alliance, uh, Landscale is a collaborative initiative um, which is being co-led by Rainforest Alliance, Vera and Conservation International, along with the growing coalition of partners. Um, and we're also really fortunate to receive strategic guidance from a range of both subject matter experts and organisations who represent our target users. So um, agribusiness companies, investment organisation, government. So yeah, a range of state and non-state actors there. So what is Landscale? Uh, moving on. Uh, so Landscale provides a globally applicable tool to assess and communicate both the status and trends of key indicators of sustainability at the scale of a whole landscape. So by landscape, we mean either a jurisdiction, um, a watershed or a user defined area of at least 100 kilometers squared. Um, and the big idea is that by making trusted information about landscape sustainability performance more widely available, um, it can be taken into account better in different types of decision making. So whether that be policy or management decisions, investment or sourcing decisions, um, and that this will lead to better alignment and more incentives for local and global action to deliver improvements in sustainability at landscape scale. But why do we think we need landscale? Moving on. Um, so we think this access to trusted information is really key to solving the systemic and complex environmental and social economic issues that we face. Um, there's obviously been a huge amount of effort from different stakeholders to date and many different tools and interventions that are out there. Um, but lots of these are often siloed. Um, and this has meant that the change we need hasn't been delivered at the scale or pace we need. Um, so the idea behind Landscale is really to provide a common framework to understand the issues, track progress and align action and incentives to deliver impact at that bigger scale. So there are three core components to Landscale. Um, the first is an assessment framework. I'm going to go into this in a little bit more detail in a minute. Um, it basically comprises goals, indicators and performance metrics that focus on outcomes. So measuring trends in things aligned with the sustainable development goals like deforestation, water quality, poverty. Um, then we've got a verification mechanism. Um, and this is a process for evaluating the accuracy of the results of the, invest, um, of the assessment. Um, and this is to give people confidence that they can use this information in their decision making. Um, and then finally, um, we are developing a reporting platform. Um, this will both facilitate the process of conducting assessments, which will um, almost always involve a range of different parties and a range of different data sources, um, and also help to visualize um, the results in a way that's meaningful to those decision makers that I mentioned earlier. Moving on. So here's an overview um, of the issues addressed by version two of the assessment framework. Um, this is now on a website as of two days ago, so you can go in and take a better look. Um, as you'll see, it's divided into four different pillars, um, and within each pillar there are goals. And these are broadly aligned with the sustainable development goals. Within each goal, um, there's a number of different indicators, and these are divided into core, landscape dependent and optional. And you can see the different symbols there indicating which indicators are core, landscape dependent or optional. So the idea being that the core indicators should always be included in an assessment. 
Um, the landscape dependent ones should be included where that issue is considered a particular risk in that landscape or of particular importance to the stakeholders in that landscape. Um, and in this new version, we've included detailed guidance on applicability. Um, and then there's optional indicators to help you build out a more comprehensive assessment where this is desirable. So just zooming in now um, to the goal on biodiversity. Um, here you can see the performance metrics that will be used to measure progress towards the goal of protecting and restoring biodiversity. Um, I won't go into those in a lot of detail, but you can just see the type of um, the type of data that would be captured in order to track progress in relation to this issue. Um, so moving on, just a recap of how it works. Well, first you define the scope of the landscape of interest. Um, then stakeholders come together to compile data and conduct the assessment. Um, then as a prerequisite for publishing the results on the um, Landscale platform, uh, the Landscale team would conduct like an in-house completeness check to um, provide assurance that it's been conducted in accordance with the guidelines. Um, and then we also offer a second level of verification, which goes into more detail um, and in it would involve a third party verifier checking the quality of the data that actually underpins the assessment. And that would be a requirement in order to make claims. Um, the claims we've introduced um, we publish detailed guidance on claims, um, which can be found on our website. Um, and the majority of these focus on performance of the whole landscape. So um, whether what has happened in relation to specific is issues at the scope of that landscape. But we do also make allowance for information about landscape performance to be combined with information about the role of specific actors in that landscape. So the contribution that those actors made or their links to the landscape through sourcing or investment. Moving on. So Landscale is really designed for diverse landscapes. It's designed to capture the cumulative impact of all activities in the landscape, both positive and negative. Um, and information is of relevance to a variety of different users from those who are likely to conduct the assessment, which in most case will be the convener or funder of a multi-stakeholder landscape approach, to those who are investing in, sourcing from, or managing that landscape, um, who will be interested in using the results. Moving on. So, Landscale is really designed to be globally recognized and globally applicable. Um, it's being developed through a very transparent and collaborative process. And we've just entered the second public consultation period um, on the assessment framework and guidelines, as well as the verification and claims mechanism. And this is being accompanied by field testing in over 10 landscapes around the world by a variety of different organizations. Um, we've really tried to make it um, the results resonate with this wide variety of different stakeholders by trying to align with the sustainable development goals as much as possible. Um, and it's designed to cover a wide range of sustainable development issues. Um, and it is applicable to a variety of different landscape management structures. So from those at the point of kind of the incubation stage, like there's some stakeholders in the landscape who want to work to tackle these systemic issues and they're ready to get started to those more mature, well-established multi-stakeholder initiatives. Um, moving on. Um, you can see that it's being tested in a variety of geographies around the world. Um, there's a variety of different challenges in each of these landscapes and different stakeholders are involved and see different benefits to using Landscale. One example that I wanted to focus on is a pilot that is about to get underway in Colombia. This was actually um, catalyzed by interest from the Zero Deforestation Advisor to the government. Um, it's going to take place in the Department of Caqueta um, and it's being used by a coalition of state and non-state actors um, to track Caqueta's progress on its road to low emissions rural development. 
Um, and the idea is that the result will be integrated into the decision-making platform for the LEDR strategy, um, which can then be used by the regional government to inform public investment and planning. Um, and it's hoped that the results of the land scale assessment will also provide credible information about the state of sustainability in the Department of Calcutta, which can help to connect the jurisdiction to new sources of funding for efforts to reduce deforestation and adapt to climate change. So this could equally be used in the um, context of monitoring the implementation and progress of an MBSAP um, in a different state. So I thought that was a relevant example to demonstrate. And then just wanted to finish with um, one final um, plea, I guess, to check out our website and please provide feedback on the assessment framework. We really welcome feedback from everyone in terms of um, both the value that Landscale can bring and the technical content of the assessment framework, verification and claims guidelines. Um, so thank you very much. And, <clears throat> thanks, Sophie. Thanks a lot. Uh, and I think there's an obvious link between the presentations of Michael and Nina and your uh, Landscale uh, platform to in terms of the monitoring, reporting, verification, sort of follow up of also on commitments to, to a platform. So uh, very interesting. Uh, Sunita, to, to you, please. Yeah, thanks, Marshall. And thanks, Sophie. Um, MJ, if we could have the Slido. Um, so um, the first uh, poll would be, should landscape initiatives that register at the platform be obliged to engage with monitoring, reporting, and verification mechanisms like landscape? So the options are whether voluntary, yes, obligatory, yes, no, or not sure. Looks like it's voluntary, yes. It's a clear sign. Can we go to the next? Oh, no. Okay. But still the majority is voluntary, yes. The next one. Are there additional topics that you think should be covered by the landscape ecosystems pillar in order to provide a comprehensive and practical assessment of biodiversity at landscape scale? And as you key in your responses, uh, I have a question for Nina. Um, so Nina, um, who do you foresee uh, will be conducting such landscape assessments? And a related question would be, how, is it, how can one provide feedback to the landscape assessment framework? I think um, the question so is for Sophia. Yeah. <laughs> um, so in most scenarios... Did I say Nina? Sorry, sorry about that, Sophie, sorry. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so in most scenarios, we would see the conveners of multi-stakeholder landscape approaches, or in some situations, the funders of those initiatives being the one to really drive the process of conducting a landscape assessment. Um, it will involve um, contributions from many different stakeholders in the landscape in terms of providing data um, and also providing input into the relevant indicators to be included in the assessment. But it's really, we really see it being most applicable in cases where there's already some drive towards multi-stakeholder action at the mm -hmm. landscape scale. Um, and yet yeah, to provide feedback, please visit our website and the public consultation is open until the beginning of December. Okay, great. Thanks, Sophie. Um, okay, now um, we, we have, we, we almost run out of time, but we would still like to uh, have a very quick discussion. And I'm going to invite the panel members to spend about one minute uh, on a question. And I'm going to, I've collected the questions that have come on the chat box from um, uh, the people who've been listening to us. Um, and there are three broad categories of questions. And, and, and um, the first one relates, set of questions relates to credibility um, of actually undertaking um, such assessments uh, of, of uh, ensuring that stakeholders um, are, um, uh, that, the that the commitments of stakeholders do not go into the greenwashing and bluewashing agendas. 
Um, so the question is, how would we ensure that that such um, um, uh, you know notional commitments are not made? That what is being committed is actually seen through. Um, that's the first set of questions. And I guess uh, between Nina and Sophie, you could try and um, uh, tackle that. The second uh, set of um, uh, questions relate to the point of how will um, landscape initiatives and approaches, how can we ensure that what we are um, speaking about here um, will be integrated in policy processes? Uh, whether it is um, uh, it is what Nina was speaking about through the platform, or what Michael was speaking about through the uh, through the, all of the work that's being done by the uh, by uh, Ipsi on 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 integrating landscape approaches into the NBSAT process, but how are we how is it possible for us to integrate this into broader policy processes? That's the second set of. Uh, that's the second batch of questions, and maybe um, between Michael. Um, and Nina, you could try and answer that. Um, and maybe Sophie, you could take the first one and, and between Michael and Nina, the second question. And the third, um, between Johan and uh, Marcel, um, it links really to, to how landscape approaches can contribute to transformative governance processes. Um, so there was a there was a related question uh, or a related uh, comment, which was that we are we are actually seeing perhaps an overlap of jurisdictions and obligations. Um, so how are we going to be dealing with this, um, and and how does all of this contribute towards a broader uh, visioning of transformative governance? as the best global assessment stated. Okay, I'm going to go with Sophie first, then it's Nina and Michael and Johan and Marcel. Just a minute to respond, please. Sophie, you're, you're on mute, Sophie. One way to try and ensure credibility is to involve different stakeholders in the landscape. So to get their feedback um, on which are the most um, important indicators and to consult them on the results. Um, the next way um, is through claims, like claims can only be based on data essentially. So we have a process for checking the quality of the data by an independent third party. Um, and then the claims relate directly to progress achieved based on that data. So those are two ways that we aim to ensure credibility and prevent greenwashing through the land scale process. We're not talking about future trends, we're talking about um, existing status or trends that have already been achieved. Hopefully that answers the question. <laughs> Yeah, thanks, 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 Sophie. Um, sorry, I, I, yeah. Um, no, I had some trouble uh, with my audio at some point when you finished. Um, Nina, and then Michael, on question two. I think it's a really important question, and, and that's why a large number of targets haven't been met to date, is because of that, that lack of verification and, and monitoring. Um, and so I think going forward functionalities in these different platforms and incentives need to be taken to ensure that there is some form of credibility whether it is you know the commitment provider is um you know the reputation is at stake if they they don't commit to updating uh, progress or they don't provide in our case at least in if they don't provide um a space a spatial boundary or a geographic location um, it should be a place where you can go and actually see something is happening. Um, so yeah, I think having these criteria for us will be one way to ensure that what we collect is, is credible um, and nudging people to provide updates, you know, and incentives that, okay, maybe their commitment is updated so it can come to the top of the list to really show progress um, and to show what they've been doing. I think it's kind of a mutually re reinforcing thing because it's a non-binding platform, the action agenda, 
you can't force anyone to do anything. So it's really finding those incentives to create uh, soft mechanisms for accountability. That's on, on that question. Thanks, Nina. Michael, on integrating into policy processes. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, so in order to integrate the landscape approach in the policy processes, I think uh, it's important to take the multi-level and multi-scale perspectives. And I think uh, in the reality now, I think there is a great increased attention to the such a uh, multi-stakeholder and of course multi-level perspective. Like uh, now are a lot of indicator and platforms and also like uh, some processes um, becoming more attending to the uh, multi-level or like a, a coordination and also the uh, interaction. Um, and of course, uh, if a po strong political will is there, uh, it might be easier to kind of uh, integrate the landscape approach in the policy processes. But uh, in reality, I think it's important to make sure that uh, we will proceed with such a multi uh, uh, level perspective. And, and I think uh, such a, in such a way, uh, there should be some chain of change and also like a partner partnering of partnerships. So that kind of a, accumulative kind of a process will finally lead to um, more systemic change and also like uh, some political decision uh, will be made for sustainability. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, Michael. Johan, on transformative governance. Uh, and landscape approaches. Johan? Yeah, this is, yep. This is of course was the global biodiversity framework is aiming for and we try to connect to that from the landscape approach uh, perspective especially by uh, looking into these mechanisms where we can sort of turn signals into the right direction and um, maybe for instance uh, a specific mechanism there is spatial planning this is where rights and also sectoral policies come together um, it's already mentioned in the global biodiversity framework but it could be more explicit for instance, because the GBO5 in for one of its transitions, it also mentions that it should be implemented at the landscape level. But then, yeah, how do you really make that participatory, inclusive, um, about balancing interests and rights for all stakeholders and now also fit it to a local context in the sense of, you know, uh, making uh, that you're aware of local land tenure systems and ownership. So, um, yeah, I, I I guess it's all about doing things uh, different than, as we, as I said in the beginning, from the business as usual pathways. And I mean, it's complex. Uh, I won't deny that. And maybe some of you have tuned into the co-land session this morning. You might have heard about sort of the, the slow building of evidence, scientific evidence. And I guess these processes just also take a long time. Um, they don't call it the decade for nothing because it takes a decade to build this into resilient, sustainable outcomes. But we could already start with that today. Thanks, Johan. Marcel? <laughs> thanks, uh, thanks, Rita. Um, uh, yeah, to me, um, transformative change is about next to uh, working on conservation and sustainable use, also addressing indirect drivers, in landscape with a multifunctional approach for people and nature. You can start to develop alternative uh, development pathways that are doing a better job for people and nature. And I think that to me is uh, the core of what we want to achieve with uh, uh, Landscapes Initiative from a transformative perspective. Super. Well, I should just hand over, let you, uh, let you segue into the wrap up session um, with apologies for taking up a little bit more time than we had intended to. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, yeah, so first of all, I'd like to thank uh, Sunita for, for moderating and uh, all the speakers for their, uh, for their presentations. I think, um, and I will not try to summarize anything, but um, the, the question from John at the beginning while he was away, uh, the, is our uh, local initiatives being noted, being reported at national and global levels? Uh, some of the polls uh, clearly indicated that there is some disconnect and some work to do um, with question, people confirming that action agenda, what is that actually? 50% of people not knowing uh, what NBCEPs are, so 
bringing landscape people and biodiversity policy people together uh, requires some further work. We all seem to be very interested in submitting commitments to a platform like Nina has presented. We would like to do that in a voluntary manner. Uh, and as also the, the last questions, uh, the issue of credibility is really of, uh, of concern in all of this to make sure that it is not a case of greenwashing, but that, that we are really uh, delivering. So while we started with a big question for this session, I also think through your presentations, uh, we have made it very concrete how to, how to make this operational. I hope that uh, you all in the audience got some inspiration and will follow up with, uh, with Michael and Nina and Sophie on the various next steps and hopefully able to apply and further help develop uh, the tools that they have uh, presented. We also on the lookout of uh, policy brief on these issues that uh, uh, UNU and Satoyama and, uh, and PBL will uh, publish on this in, uh, in, the, in the coming months. And we hope we have uh, challenged uh, your thinking a little bit in also considering uh, making commitments from a landscape perspective to, to the biodiversity uh, policy process. Um, so I'll, I'll leave it with that. Again, thanks a lot uh, for all of you in the audience. Apologies for being a bit over time, but I think we, uh, we had a great session and uh, I look, follow, uh, look forward to follow up. And uh, thanks a lot and enjoy the rest of the meeting. Bye. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you all.